Our final, our last, certainly not least, author this evening is Richard B. Wright, who won the 2001 Trillium Award for his novel, Clara Callan. Tonight, Richard will be reading from his latest novel, Mr. Shakespeare's Bastard. Terrific title. <laughs> It's very nice to be here and to celebrate the quarter century anniversary of the Trillium Prize for Ontario Writers, and um, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm going to read from my um, latest novel, Mr. Shakespeare's Bastard, published in 2010. Uh, and in this novel, the protagonist and narrator, Erlene Ward, is a housekeeper in a country home in Oxfordshire. And Erlene, now in her 70th year, feels the need to reveal the great secret that has shaped her life, namely that she is the illegitimate daughter of England's most famous playwright, William Shakespeare. Over the next several months, Erlene will relate to Charlotte, the young mistress of the house, how, as a young woman, Erlene's mother was spurned by the local village for her sexual waywardness, and so set out for London, where she met a young actor at the beginning of his career in the theatre. She will then tell of how she became pregnant by him and of how she was forced to return to the village that had rejected her and to live once again in the home of her brother and her reproachful sister-in-law. This little section I'm reading tonight is a one in which Erlene's mother, now gravely ill, relates how she and the young Shakespeare spent their Sunday mornings in the autumn of 1587 in London when he was just a young man of 23. A walk cost nothing but shoe leather, and soon your father and I were discovering the city together on Sunday mornings. With all those bells ringing around us, sometimes we almost had to shout at each other, and then we'd laugh. What curiosity he had. I see that in you too, Erlene, always asking questions about this and that, puzzling over how things came to be, casting looks at passers-by and imagining how their lives were lived. He took so much into himself, your father, but he was good company for all that, even if he sometimes wore me thin with his questions and observations. We might be walking eastward by the tower with him surmising who might lie within, and what privations and what tortures awaited him, what thoughts might course through a man's restless mind the night before the scaffold or the block. Or he might walk westward to gape at the great houses near Whitehall, and then he might be wondering what they were eating for dinner that day or how many servants it took to dress the lady of the house. One day he asked about my husband and how he died. Oh, your father was a great one for talking about death, a favorite subject, no mistaking that. So I told him some things about Wilkes, but not others, dwelt at length on his brutish nature, and said he died of a fever. So ashamed was I of the brawling end of him. Another day I could not help myself and mentioned an old lover, Henry Chapman, and how kind and gentle a man he was, though he had no words to speak. And this affected your father greatly, and he stopped there on the street. Tell me about him, he said. No words at all this fellow, and yet right enough in his mind, he seemed astonished. Yes, I said, but he could hear, he could hear words. Yes, I said, it was strange, a defect at birth perhaps. But your father couldn't get over such an affliction, not to be able to use words, he kept saying, to hear them and not be able to shape a response with words, how horrible. Another time we were in Finsbury Fields near the archery butts, and some gallants and their lady friends had gathered nearby. They looked to have been carousing all night, and they were still drinking wine and singing body songs. One young man was standing behind a girl, showing her how to hold a bow and draw the string to guide the arrow to the target. Both could barely stand with their drunkenness, and your father said something about fools and wine being poor bedfellows. And we took care to walk on one side of them, advancing perhaps fifty paces. Then didn't an arrow pass not ten feet in front of us, followed by a great roar of laughter? When we looked, we saw that the drunkards had fallen forward and were on the grass laughing. 
The arrow had gone astray with their falling, and they found it amusement itself, and not a word of apology from any of them. We walked on, but your father was brooding on the event. He was very good at brooding, your father, and it would get on your nerves, all those dark thoughts of his. When finally we sat upon the grass near the windmills, he said, Just think on it, Elizabeth. Had our pace been swifter by a step or two, or had we set out a few moments earlier, that arrow might have struck one of us, and all because of those rich young fools were playing drunken games. Now that set him off. It's all a matter of chance, is it not? He said. Imagine you pass down a street where a madman awaits, his head filled with voices, where there is a horse alarmed suddenly by the sting of a bee, and it rears above you as you pass those hooves coming down upon your eyes. Or an arrow, carelessly released, flies through the air and into your throat. A welling of blood in your mouth, and in an instant all is gone. The morning's bright air, the grass, the blue sky above these milling blades, all gone forever. Are we then not simply at the mercy of fortune's wheel? I told him I could not see life that way, walking about as if forever on the brink of untimely events. Besides, I said, there were charms enough to ward off misadventure, old sayings and rituals that kept you from peril by reminding the spirit world of your innocence. Perhaps God in his wisdom is behind it all. But, he said, what of those innocent souls who are still waylaid by chance? Well, I said, there must be a reason behind all things, and there's an end to it, as I don't care to dwell on talk like this on such a fine day. He could tell I was angry and said nothing more about it on that autumn morning. But it was like your father to hold such forebodings. The more I got to know him, the more I saw... She paused, as though trying to fasten her memory of him firmly in her mind, so that she might encompass him by a single feature of his character. In her illness, ma'am seemed determined to tell me of my father's essence, as she saw it. And this was not like her, for usually she preferred to skim across the surface of things like a waterfly. Anything too deep was troublesome to her nature. But perhaps nearing her end, she wanted to discover for herself a stronger impression of the man who had fathered her child. Erlene, your father was a cautious young man, watchful not only of misplaced arrows or lanes where madmen lurked with knives and voices in their heads. He apprehended danger everywhere. I have seen him push away a plate of oysters that another might eat heartily, and he was careful in boisterous company. Now and then we dined with fellow players on a Saturday night, and your father was merry enough, he could trade a jest with anyone, but always I sensed his discomfort when others got drunk and quarrelsome. He used to say that our wits weaken in drunkenness, and a misplaced word can lead to blows, and blows to swordplay or cudgels, and thence to severed hands or broken heads. Now, do not misunderstand me. Your father was no coward, but he was careful at all times, measuring the consequences of an action. Prudence is a virtue, is it not, I said. It is. But my father was good company, ma'am. Excellent company, as I've already told you, she said. Pay attention, Erlene, please. Ma'am's pain had often put her out of patience with me, and my questions, and I felt bad for upsetting her, but I couldn't seem to help myself, so eager was I to learn more about my father. I have already told you how curious he was about everything, ma'am said, how filled with strange facts and stories. Your father read a great deal, and he was delighted when he discovered that I too could read. He hadn't expected it of me. And how did he discover that? I asked. You are old enough now to know that we must have lain together to have you. So it was on one occasion at his room in Hollywell Lane, which he shared with two others. And this was not long after that Sunday morning in Finsbury Fields. Indeed, a part of me thinks it might have been the very day. The other fellows were at the playhouse working on the properties for the next day's performance. The room we sh shared was poor and barely furnished, only a pair of truckle beds and an old dresser and a chair, a chest and a small shelf of books. I had picked up a book from this little shelf, there were only five or six, and I said, who is Ovid and what is the meaning of the title? And your father said, why, well, you can read, Elizabeth. Of course I can, I said, and write my name, too, though I can't pretend knowledge on any subject, as I haven't read much, parts of the Bible, I said. My brother and his wife are Puritans, and the few books in the house make dry reading. Still you can read, he said, putting his arms around me and hugging me from behind. I remember his breath on my neck. 
A beginning at any rate, I'll read some of Ovid to you. He was a Roman who lived about the time of Christ, but he got into trouble and the authorities in Rome had him banished. Ovid was your father's favorite writer and he told me the title of the book but I've forgotten, though I do recall the stories. All had to do with changing forms. They were about a spirit world in ancient Greece or Rome where humans lived with gods and sometimes mated with them or were changed by them into plants or trees or other creatures. I liked them because this Ovid was very good at describing nature. But to your father, this book was like a Bible. He could not get enough of these wondrous tales and told me he had been reading them since he was a schoolboy when he studied them in the Latin tongue. However, she added with a little smile, I must tell you, Erleen, that your father was full of earthly passion and I too had sorely missed the touch of a man. And so the reading of Ovid was soon put aside. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.